Hello everyone, my name is Sam Abraham and I'm talking to you today about logging in .NET Core leveraging MongoDB database. A little bit about me, I'm a software developer, I live in South Florida. Uh, please feel free to connect with me and reach out via my LinkedIn page or my blog. Uh, the links of each are on the screen. Our game plan today, uh, we're going to start. So basically, we're talking about logging in a .NET Core project using Serilog to a MongoDB database. There's so many pieces here. So we're going to start by introducing and providing a quick overview of each of these layers. So we're going to do an overview of .NET Core, uh, quick introduction to Mongo, about MongoDB, talk a little bit about that. Uh, talk about .NET Core logging in general, how extensible and, and how can we can easily plug into uh, what's already uh, provided for us. And then talk about Serilog as one such package. And then we'll do a demo showing all these three pieces, .NET Core 3.1 worker service project, uh, using Serilog to write log messages, structured event log messages to MongoDB. So we start with .NET Core. So what's .NET Core? Well, .NET Core is a fresh from the ground up rewrite of the .NET platform. Uh, it's lightweight and the Microsoft team has opted to start from scratch, uh, move into a leaner, uh, cleaner uh, architecture, if you would say. Uh, everything is an opt-in. So you get a very lean uh, bare bone core runtime, and then we as developers explicitly opt in to whatever libraries or extensions that we would need to enhance and develop our applications with. And we do that by uh, bringing in these packages from NuGet package manager. So everything is out there, everything is open source at least the .NET Core libraries and whatever extensions that are available uh, from Microsoft and other open source packages they are there. And for example, if I need a logging package, I'll go to NuGet, bring it in. If I need to create a Windows service, I have to bring in uh, and take a dependency on a certain package that would expose that API. And then the .NET Core runtime is very modular and you know in a sense composable enough that i would just could adding such a big feature like creating a windows service out of a worker service could be just as easy as uh, an extra api call just because how clean uh, the framework and that platform is and easily how extensible it is so currently it's at version 3.1 and that's an LTS version, which means that Microsoft is committed to supporting it for the next three years. But one thing to note, uh, .NET Framework versus .NET Core. With .NET Core in general, things are evolving very, very fast. So the long-term support for a .NET Core Framework version is three years versus if we look back at the .NET Framework, uh, things continuously evolve Newer API is usually available periodically, but so far as as changes, I mean the, the .NET framework has been stable, uh, and you know I don't believe it has changed much for many many years. So that's kind of part of of the reason of of why I start fresh. Another reason that I see could be uh, also a good motivator for the .NET Core rewrite is we're starting with a very lean uh, infrastructure here. And that's very important, especially if we're writing uh, cloud-enabled applications or if our applications already are living in the cloud. Because in the cloud, you got to have to be able to scale, uh, leveraging microservices or Kubernetes, uh, or any of the many auto scaling features that all cloud providers uh, offer. But as we scale up, so will, you know, 
our cost will also go up. So, and cost in the cloud, a good portion of what we pay for our compute resources, which means if, if my code is not performing well for any reason, if my code is bulky, I'll definitely pay more because I'm going to take up more compute resources, memory, network, CPU, hard drive space, and all of these are not, these components are now provided as services. So we'll be paying for each. And all cloud providers now have really nice dashboards that, that show us that break down that cost for, for us to really see it. And so will our business users and so will people paying the bill. So starting fresh, starting clean and paying attention to compute, paying attention to what is it that we consume. It's not just about getting a feature out there or a program out there. We got to also start thinking about its total cost of ownership end to end. It's not just about getting the feature out is how will it scale? How much will it cost us just running in the cloud? And can that be tweaked? Can that be improved? And if it can now starting fresh is the opportunity to build all that in. So the talking about the .NET release schedule. Uh, so 3.1 came out around December of 2019. Now that timeline is pretty much accurate. I checked May, May 2020. Uh, this so far is on track. 3.1 was out around December 2019. Everybody now excited and look forward to start playing with .NET 5, which is slated for end of year release. We look forward to that. Uh, .NET 5 is gonna bring uh, back support uh, for the .NET framework components, or most of them at least. Uh, we'll move, migrate that into the .NET Core platform. So, Right now, of course, we're very limited in terms of, in some instances, having to target some of our projects against the .NET framework and some against .NET Core. And that, that creates an overhead is because now some of our projects end up running in separate spaces just because they do things that .NET Core doesn't yet support, so they need to run the .NET framework. So now we got to wrap an API around them. Uh, if we still want to leverage .NET Core for the rest of our application, so uh, bringing in all these common uh, features that developers have been asking for uh, into .NET Core, and then renaming that as .NET 5, so now there's no more that separation between .NET Framework and, and .NET Core. Of course, there are things like web forms. Uh, uh, now that's, that's the equivalent of that is Blazor. So there are new and emerging tools, components uh, that will definitely need to get up to speed on. And then that will probably be a recommended migration path. Most components, most projects, hopefully we'll be able to get on .NET 5 fine. Uh, some may, may require a more extensive of a rewrite. So we're all waiting uh, and again, anticipating this towards the end of 2020 and look forward to, to playing with it. So that was .NET Core. Now we can talk briefly about MongoDB. So what's MongoDB? Well, it's a database engine. Uh, it's a NoSQL database engine. So what that really means, so let's think of SQL Server, for example. So SQL Server is a relational database. So what does that mean? 
Well, uh, that means I'm creating a database. Inside of it, I have preset tables with preset fields. Uh, optional fields are nullable. So that what that really means for me is I am flexible into not passing in values for these fields, but that does not mean uh, that whatever document that I'm sending, that does not mean that this field uh, cannot be in there unless I'm defaulting it, right? So I'll have to create default values. Either way, that field is always taking up space in every row I'm writing to the database. So it's an okay restriction if my data is pretty much set, if uh, I'm stable in a sense that I'm not going to keep adding fields, then it becomes, you know, okay to manage. But in some instances, especially for example, like logging, where unless I end up creating a field in, in, for example, SQL, whether it being a XML type or a byte, uh, var binary or an N text or var car max, uh, unless I end up creating such a field, uh, then I may end up either creating unnecessary fields that are all nullable since logging may or may not uh, always include every single field I'm interested in uh, or uh, create that bulky one field like XML type and just put in uh, the data, the logging data, logging payload, uh, for example, as XML or as JSON in that column, which is totally okay, but then mining on that data is not as easy, right? So now we have to uh, write additional queries. Uh, a lot more work is required uh, to be able to do something intelligent with the logging data, uh, run certain statistics, so looking for certain occurrences of particular events that have been occurred or exceptions that have occurred. So while we can definitely do that, I personally don't believe that SQL Server is the place for these kind of records. And I don't believe that initially uh, SQL Server was intended to be used for you know, that purpose. And this is where no SQL or document-based databases stand out because what is the equivalent of a SQL table row is now in a NoSQL database like MongoDB is treated as a document. So in SQL Server world, we have a row. In MongoDB world, that translates into a document. And what that document is, now that's very flexible. Row in SQL Server is already preset since the table has already all the fields preset and predefined on the table. But for MongoDB, a document and the content of a document is very flexible. It can pretty much contain anything with one exception that it has, it is required to have a field called ID that has to be unique across all the documents inside, well, that collection. So let's just jump real quick, define what that is, and then go back and talk more about documents in MongoDB. So MongoDB defines databases. Inside the databases, we can define one or more collections. Think of collections almost as tables, SQL tables, the equivalent of that. Containers of data. Inside the collection, I have one or more documents, which would be the equivalent of uh, rows in a SQL table. So jumping back to what we were saying is, well, the document can be very flexible. The content of it does not have to be the same among within the same collection. So I can have three documents in a collection and the content of each aside from that field called ID that needs to be unique 
uh, across all the documents in a collection, it can be very flexible in terms of what goes inside the document as fields. I can have a couple of fields in document one, totally different fields in document two, and MongoDB will work just fine. Uh, MongoDB stores these documents in BSON format, which is binary encoded JSON. All what that is, is, is documents are objects and they are represented as JSON objects when they are uh, deserialized. But uh, when they're serialized to disk and stored in memory, they're converted to BSON, which all what it is is a binary encoded JSON. Uh, MongoDB is schemaless, which is pretty much what we just shared regarding the documents not having a set schema. Uh, easy scaling, uh, we can easily add uh, more shards in a cluster and we'd be able to horizontally scale our database as we need more resources, as we need to load balance uh, the load on the database. It's very easy to spin up an Atlas MongoDB cluster, very easy to get started. You actually can get started uh, free. Uh, we'll talk more about this next, but uh, that ease of use, ease of scalability also ensures that we have minimal downtime. And that really helps. So we have horizontal scaling, we have vertical scaling whenever we're scaling up resources. Vertical scaling probably would entail a longer downtime, usually, and we're talking generally speaking, of course, if it, things are well architectured, uh, we may work around this, but adding vertical scaling means adding more resources to, in addition to what's already there, will probably involve some downtime. Horizontal scaling, on the other hand, may just mean adding another node, like with Kubernetes. And adding another node may not involve any downtime or may involve just minimal downtime. There are things to consider, again, as we're cloud enabling our applications or as we're thinking towards a path to migrate to the cloud is uh, everything is available as a service in a cloud environment. Uh, all my resources are billed as a service. My hardware is a virtualized set of resources, my compute, my drive space. Uh, how can I be as optimal as possible in terms of the code I'm writing? And how can I leverage this flexibility, that elasticity, the ability to scale up? Uh, and then back down. How can I support that in my code as I architect it? So I'm able to uh, exist in a cloud environment without further investments um, in development so far as effort, especially if I'm starting with a fresh app, I might as well build that in because that's a trend. Everybody's moving to the cloud now. So, Going back to what we said about MongoDB. So the community edition in Mongo is free. So we can just go ahead and download the database server. Uh, it's free and runs on Windows, runs on Linux, uh, which is awesome on the Mac thing. So uh, there is an enterprise edition, of course. You just, you pay. Uh, it's a paid for uh, package, but it adds a few more features uh, above and beyond what the community edition is free. Now the community edition is, is in itself fully featured for common use. If, if we would say we used it, amazing, can feel the difference. Quick, very, very quick response time and uh, and, and awesome on resources running on Linux, uh, the uh, Ubuntu uh, edition, uh, just amazing. Just running 
super fast, processing millions of records and was no problem, no hiccup. Now every scenario varies, but overall I'm just trying to highlight that there's nothing wrong with the community edition to get started with, even uh, and depending on your environment, depending on your needs, that may be even sufficient for handling you know, mid-sized companies traffic. And again, it all depends, right? In, in, in programming, software development, uh, there is no right or wrong answer. It's usually the answer is that it all depends. So going back to MongoDB uh, availability, well, so we said, fine, you can go ahead and download the database, MongoDB database server and set it up on your workstation or your server. And you can start for free. You have the community edition, which is free. Well, what if you want to host that in the cloud? Well, you're in luck. Of course, you can set up your own uh, virtual machine or your own EC2 instance and configure uh, MongoDB on there. That would be fine. So it's as if uh, you're just running a virtual uh, desktop in the cloud, more of a you know, leveraging the cloud as an infrastructure, as a service provider, which is totally cool, but maybe a little bit uh, more uh, of an overhead because now you carry the burden of maintaining these virtual machine nodes. Or you can leverage out of the box uh, Mongo Atlas, which is basically uh, Mongo partnering with Azure and AWS and being available there as an additional service. So, and that will leverage. So when you want to spin up, first of all, we can, everybody can get started playing with Mongo Atlas because it offers a free tier, which is always free forever, or at least for now. Uh, I think it's 500 megabyte, uh, that tier, I believe it's an M0 tier, and it comes with basic, uh, I believe it's a three, it's a cluster, three shards uh, running on AWS, and, and it's all for free, so you can try it, can play with it. Uh, Otherwise, uh, the paid Atlas services, uh, they exist on Azure and on AWS. And, and the way it works is you'll provide your uh, account credentials in Atlas and Atlas uh, or Mongo Atlas will go and provision the necessary uh, Azure instances, AWS EC2 instances, EC2 cluster uh, to support and run MongoDB and then they'll maintain that for you. So that becomes uh, a worry-free Mongo Atlas instance cloud-based offering and you would just pick uh, from a preset a set of configurations that are available with the ability to change, to tweak things for, of course, additional costs, whether it being uh, extra IOPS, extra storage. Uh, but the idea is getting started quickly. The idea is also it becomes less of a maintenance burden in terms of maintaining the underlying uh, infrastructure that, that runs the database. Uh, MongoDB offers or has available uh, quite a few uh, client tools, uh, the equivalent of SQL Server Management Studio. Uh, an example is MongoDB Compass, which is available free uh, and ships with the Community Edition as well as the Enterprise Edition. And also Robo3T uh, is a free UI GUI-based client for MongoDB that we can download and use free of charge. Uh, there is also the Mongo shell, which is a command line interactive client tool that we can also use uh, to connect to our MongoDB database instance. All right, so we talked about uh, logging and .NET briefly. 
But now I think is the time uh, to dive a little deeper. So now that we've talked about .NET Core overall, MongoDB, let's go back and talk more about logging. So .NET Core, very extensible package itself, the runtime, the platform, very bare bone, uh, comes with hooks in place, you know, interfaces, contracts that we can implement to further extend and add more features and more layers on top of that bare bone runtime layer. Uh, one such extensibility point is the logger factory. So once we bring in uh, import via NuGet, the Microsoft extensions logging package, uh, that makes available uh, an iLogger factory that we can implement to uh, provide a full implementation of logging and the logger factory in our program. The way uh, Microsoft Extension Logging has a default logger factory from Microsoft. And what it does is it really encapsulates a list of loggers. So we are registering different logging providers with a logger factory, and each would give us uh, one or more different logger instances. And the logger factory would be uh, that facade that we would call and would handle for us uh, the routing uh, of the different messages, having the knowledge of all the providers that are registered uh, with that factory, right? So that's how I make uh, a logging layer very flexible, right? I have the factory and I can keep adding different providers that implement my contract. And I can tweak those providers so along with them. I can pass in certain rules or filters that make it so that my logging message traffic uh, either gets processed by a certain logger, certain provider, or gets skipped. So Imagine it as you have a pipeline, a big flow pipeline with many, many messages uh, going in. And then you have different listeners along that pipeline. So the messages are coming in and then you have different listeners and each based on the filtering criteria that, that each is configured with, you would either take the message, process it and, and send it somewhere or not, or skip. So that's the iLogger factory and logger factory implementation here or architecture. We support multiple providers. We have log levels, which is all what that is, is like there, there are switches that tell us the level at which or level of importance of a certain message. So it could be a debug message, information, error, warning, critical. And of course, these are all switches that we can use either later on mining on data uh, or also as a factor, which actually we will use in our demo to filter out certain messages. So I can say my Serilog provider is only going to listen for debug messages and is going to write these messages to MongoDB, which is actually we're going to see that in our demo. So, and then we also have scoping. So we have the idea. So one thing we did was creating, uh, adding logging in a batch like uh, worker service. So worker service is a long running process, usually used for ETLs, for instance, or, or pretty much anything that, that occurs, runs on a timer, takes a while. So it's not, you know, a request response like an API. It's more uh, of a long running batch process for ETL, for instance. So with that, if we're running a batch, one thing that 
came in very handy is the ability to define scopes. So my scope becomes as if it's like a batch ID. So I, once I create a scope, I can plug in or inject certain values and then they become uh, properties or attributes of every log message I write. And one thing we wrote was a batch ID. So it became uh, for query per later querying purposes, it became give me all log messages for that certain batch ID, which we defined uh, in a scope at the beginning of, of the run uh, of that worker service. Uh, providers, as we said, they're configured uh, to listen in based on certain filters and configured to write to certain destinations or, event or syncs. Uh, we call it, which is a place where these log provider is going to write the message. Could be a file, could be console, could be an email, could be a, a Windows event log, could be MongoDB or SQL Server. We are all log syncs or log endpoints. Uh, where is the final destination that message will be logged to? That's the log provider controls. And that can be configured via the API or also in app settings, as we're going to see in our demo. Cool, so now we talk about Serilog. So Serilog is one uh, logging package for .NET. Advantages of Serilog, it's a newer package. It uses structured event data. So as we're gonna see in the next slide, the my, well, let's do it now. Here is an example of structured logging. I'm logging an error and I'm logging a string. And my strings has failed to process record I'm passing in a client record for client. Now, my client ID is a value type. If I am serializing and writing this message as a string, uh, I'm gonna have one string in my database is gonna include client ID just as a string. Uh, and then I may or may not, it depends if, if I have uh, an implementation on, like, for example, two string on my client record object. That's an object. Well, client record is an object. Client ID is a value type. Then I may also be able to write the fields that client record contains. Client ID, first name, last name, also probably as string and, and create a nice string representation of that. And then I'm writing that string to the database. So that's with a typical uh, string message that gets logged uh, would look like. Now with structured logging is different. With structured logging, now it's using these placeholders as labels, right? So my client ID now is gonna become a field that I'm writing as a key value pair, not just as a string. So my message that I am logging is going to contain uh, a JSON object, right? So I'm, I'm logging again. Uh, let's think of it, think about it in the context of MongoDB. So I write my data in, in uh, data is deserialized uh, out of the box in JSON format and displayed that way, all the client tools, Compass, uh, Robo3T. So I, so I'll have an object called client record. Once I, I call this message, leveraging structure logging, and it will have all these fields under it, client ID, first name, and last name. And then it's gonna have another field called client ID, and it's gonna have the value one, two, three, four. So with structured event logging, I moved away from logging plain flat strings to logging flexible uh, live schema-less objects that I can now mine and analyze uh, without having to use constructs like contains or use additional XML syntax if I were to store this XML without leveraging any more calls in SQL, for example, to process any XML data. This is just available in a database like MongoDB as JSON data. And with structured logging, uh, I now have uh, these tags are no longer just placeholders that will 
build a string for me. These tags become live um, objects, so to speak, object records. Then I now, they get written as key value pairs that I can later mine and study. So going back, that's what structured event data is. I hope I uh, explained it well enough. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Uh, so setter log, login package for .NET, you get it from NuGet, it's free, it's open source, it's a newer package uh, versus log for net and nlog and other packages. So this is newer. Uh, there are some benchmarks on setter log that show it to be more performant than nlog and log for net. Again, for our purposes, it worked very well. It was very performant. Uh, I usually look at benchmarks that are out there. Uh, there are a lot of other factors to consider when looking at a benchmark. There's definitely the hardware, the environment. Uh, the benchmark is a snapshot. Uh, the true answer lies in, in the full environment end to end. But in general, generally speaking, uh, many articles, many benchmarks have agreed that Serilog, in whatever testing they did, appears to run to be more performant uh, than log4net, than nlog. And again, uh, we looked at this, we used it as a general guide. It wasn't the only factor which prompted us uh, to use it. Uh, the availability of many multiple things, availability of uh, really good support for it, community support via Stack Overflow, uh, the availability of a lot of out-of-the-box enhancements, uh, like enrichments, for example, is the ability gives you the out-of-the-box ability, just importing certain packages from NuGet, uh, gives you the ability to uh, report more on a certain object and get more information on it, such as exceptions, we're gonna see that in our demo, uh, such as a thread ID, uh, et cetera. And the availability of multiple things, as we said, available from NuGet. Uh, things are record destinations that this gets written to, uh, logging messages get written to. So an example would be console, an exa example it would be file, an example would be MongoDB, uh, etc. And everything again is accessible uh, from NuGet. So let me real quick uh, Share this if you can see it. Uh, so this is the primary serilog package. And then uh, you know, going to the project, it pretty much introduces uh, what structural logging is and what it, it helps you accomplish. And then uh, you know, structure data. And then uh, I'm trying to see, uh, here we go. And this is everything, all the different things. So see, you have the file, uh, console, uh, the ASP.NET core one is the one that replaces that logger factory. It's uh, newer. Uh, however, what we opted to use, although this was available, uh, Oh, I'll talk about one more feature of Serilog is, is you have enrichments. And what enrichments are, they're a different, they're additional. Again, they're also packages that we need to opt into, but they would allow us to uh, capture out of the box without us having to uh, write any code, capture additional information about, about you know, either the calling stack, the object, or the message being written, right? Like thread ID, uh, inner exceptions, which we'll see today, uh, et cetera. So quick example. Uh, so structure logging basically is, is I'm logging a string, like say log error, fail to process record. Uh, now that's a string. So if I'm, 
writing this and just plugging these value uh, in its string format, I can probably serialize that's an object and that's a field, right? So I can probably serialize that object even in JSON and then just store this as text, store this as, you know, if I'm doing that XML, I can store that in XML data type in SQL, for example, right? But then I'm limited uh, to how you know much value I get out of this data, right? In terms of querying on it or, or mining it. Uh, and if I do, it's not going to be as performance, especially if I deal with millions of records. Now that again, there are third-party providers uh, that do this out of the box, but we wanted to do this in-house on-prem, and that's why kind of we that was our own implementation. So. But but just kind of logging to a file or logging to SQL Server, I may be losing value. I may be kind of leveraging the wrong tool for that particular purpose. Questions or, or comments so far? So far, so good. Perfect. So uh, we showed some of the packages real quick but but that slide really tackles so serialog extensions hosting again that's a new get package and that is a package that that offers uh, it's not user serialog it's use serialog that's a typo but when calling this when building uh, so let's actually stop here uh, and let's create a new project Okay, and what we were creating was a worker service, which is the what a worker service is 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 is, is primarily uh, it, it, you can think of it as as a Windows service, you know, kind of just a background process running maybe an ETL job or a long running process. That would be what you know an example use case for a worker service. Uh, Notice that, that out of the box, it gave me the option to uh, kind of build a Docker file for that. I, I didn't go ahead with this for, for this particular talk, but that's definitely something very interesting to talk about how it become very easy to containerize any of our application. You know, you got the templates, you got most of the toolings, excellent documentation. All right, one thing I, I wanted to to share. So say I'm I'm getting started on this in general or anything new, um, especially with the .NET, you know, even framework at this point. Anything .NET, anything open source. Uh, one beautiful thing Microsoft does more now is, is everything is open, you know, everything is open. The source code is out there. Uh, so if I go to tools and that's one way as I personally play with things, I go to debugging general and notice and, and it slows down your environment. That's a test VM I have. That's actually probably going to just go away after this talk. Uh, but if you look at this option, I have this unchecked and I have this checked enable.net source stepping and I, I disable enable just my code. Uh, that option, I check that up and then uncheck this, check that off. Then I go to symbols and I make sure I have NuGet and Microsoft symbol servers selected. Now, what that will do for me is, uh, is I can now say, um, I read about worker services, um, amazed. I feel this is the way I need to go, uh, but I've never worked on this before. Uh, it's new. And I want to kind of explore more. I read blogs, but nothing, uh, in my opinion, 
sub is a substitute to actually kind of digging deep into it and 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 kind of really uh you know kind of investigating it kind of doing the self study and and putting in the effort there uh the blogs are good uh they'll usually uh show value or spark my interest in in doing something but then you start working with it and you run all of, into all you know you run across all of these uh, issues that that you know like a, a generic blog article may not cover, so that's one way you know when I'm trying to d dig a little deeper into something. Like for example, let's take an example here. So I created that worker service. I had already read that it's awesome. It's 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 a you know serves a good uh, kind of a creates a uh, a good starting point for long running processes. Uh, that are like background ETL jobs, the equivalent of a Windows service, and this can run as a Linux cron job or as a Windows service. Right now, by default, it's as if it's an EXE with a thread, right? So by default, the way this is going to run as we run it right now, is going to run as if you're running an EXE and you're forking, you know, you're forking off a thread, you're starting a thread here, you know, to invoke that worker, right? And it's going to run that execute async in a loop. Right, it's gonna, you know, invoke this and it's just gonna keep running it in a loop. You know, await, sleep, and run, right? Just like you know, your your uh your service thread uh in in a Windows service, right? However, uh so I wanna know more about it. So now that I've checked uh checked off the option to enable uh us to to step into uh, the runtime code uh, i can uh, where is my breakpoint okay so let's see i don't know where the breakpoint is so let's run it again see if is it debug yes 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 so let's go and start it perfect so now I see host create host builder and I don't know what exactly this does. So I'm going to go ahead. Uh, so I had already downloaded this, but what it really did is it went uh, and downloaded, you know, uh, oh, the source for that package, Microsoft extension hosting. And now uh, I have the code, so all what that does, for example, it maps. I mean, it tells you, it tells us here, but you know, it just maps my app settings uh, file, and now I I have knowledge of that for configuration entries, and then uh, loads, you know, does a little bit of you know intelligent things to handle user secrets, application name, register environment variables, and then. It does a few things that actually uh, interesting to know is guess what? By default, it configured a few default loggers. Now that's important if if we're adding our own, right? So, and and we'll we'll go through this. But just that, that's an example uh, of of you know how to kind of dig a little bit deeper into this. Same goes for the serlog package. Uh, you know, just just enable the debugging, step through it. And it, it's an awesome learning tool. So I'll go back uh, to the slides here. So, so talking about the packages that 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 we're planning to use today. So Serilog extension hosting is an implementation for the iLogger factory. It replaces that full that whole pipeline. Uh, we're not doing that today. Today we're going to use Serilog extension logging, uh, recommended with .NET Core 2.1 and up. It just uh, registers a new I logger uh, uh, with with you know the logging factory, the Microsoft extension logging. It just registers an additional I logger there, and then we have Serilog. Actually, let's do it that way. Let's go ahead and add them. Uh, so let's go do that right now. I'm going to go to add browse 
And I'm going to say, OK, server log. And that's the package already gives us a little bit of information on it and we can see it's pretty popular. So I'm going to go ahead and install. And now that's that that's very also important to do as I'm opting into these packages. I got to know what dependencies am I taking on right after all. Uh, one of the the, my, the bigger premises. Uh, in 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 me taking on all these dependencies is, is is leveraging .NET Core is to actually not take on dependencies that I don't know about or an overhead, right? So what I'm getting here is you know I/O and runtime libraries that will work and server log the core package that will work with the extension logging. So okay, I guess I need that. Uh, you opt in to the license agreements of these packages. That is fine. Most of them are Microsoft with the exception of. Uh, OK, even that package and then. Uh, and then so that's the, lo yeah, the, the, the logging engine. So I got that uh, that blocks into .NET Core. So now what else do I need? So now that I, I have the core serial log logger. I need syncs, right? I need endpoints that that Sarah log will log to either support for logging to files or MongoDB as as you know we're going to do. So um, other thing, you know, another thing that that, that you know I, I would share as as I'm adding complexity into my code, right? So if I'm saying I'm going to log to MongoDB, right? How many points of of failure I have here. Well, and you know, first I'm adding that new logger. So that's one thing that can go wrong. Second is logging to MongoDB. So that layer also. So if I have, if I'm doing this new, which kind of is, is when, when we, you know, started with this project. Well, I want to minimize uh, the layers of complexity here. So that's why, for example, the first thing I did is, okay, let's get setter log working, study it, benchmark it. Right, and that's fine. Uh, I'm not overriding the Microsoft uh, provided console uh, uh, logger, so you know, does it make sense to have a city log sync console? I'm not going to know the difference. You know, it's going to lock the console, so I'm better off. So I created. I first took on a dependency uh, on a file city log file sync which logs to files, right? And my plan, which actually I'm, I'm going to show right now that the, the progression of this is if I want to get server log set up, I might as well first have it log uh, somewhere where, where the actual complexity are no, no additional pieces that server log abstracts away from me like it does for MongoDB. Because for MongoDB, I have a MongoDB driver, right? And server log communicates with that driver talking to MongoDB. So if I have a failure, uh, one thing server log does uh, if if for for those of us who used it before, unless you turn on, you can do uh, you can enable uh, server log server log self logging, you know where yeah, but otherwise server log may not throw any any errors uh, up front. So you gotta have everything set up in place, every you know kind of cross all the T's, dot all the I's, make sure everything works and then uh, turn or er, you know turn that mechanism on. So I started this way. I went created the file sync, you know, took the file sync. Now we discussed uh, not having to configure that API in, in code, right? And, and for us to do this, uh, there is another package, right? Which is setter lock settings configuration. And what this will allow us at some point in, in our demo that we are now going to be able to define all the server lock switches in our app settings. So let's also install it. And again, because the runtime itself is is very uh, lean, uh, you know, back with .NET framework, all of these probably, I mean, similar packages where just just came in bundled with the DLL. So um, now we have to opt in. OK, and now one more thing uh, we're going to have to do. Uh, we are. Uh, 
we need to better exception handling and, and, and we need to log exceptions using that structured event data logging. So that is another package for that. Uh, exception. And now we're going to install that as well. And then uh, one more thing we said we're going to use switches uh, to control which messages Serilog receives and forwards on to store in MongoDB. And to do that, there is another package for expression and filter expression right here. So that's pretty much uh, what we needed here. So let's recap real quick. Let's look at the packages that we took on. We took on the serial log extension logging to add in the you know serial log logging package. Uh, serial log itself needs syncs to control where these messages are going to go. We set up the file sync temporarily just to test with and get things set up with serial log and all the switches that we needed for filtering the messages. And then ultimately we're going to switch to MongoDB. So let's go ahead and install that. This way we don't have to visit NuGet again in this demo. Now MongoDB is see, and that's what I talked about. Uh, you know the abstract, you know the the complexity that this hides from us. I see MongoDB sync in itself deals with the MongoDB driver, right? So all of that is is hidden from us. So we want to make sure that that as we work on all these different layers and pieces, that especially if we're setting that up new, we're on a benchmark it. Uh, we want to isolate where the issue is is to work at, on, on these you know in layers or iteratively or you know more in an agile way so at this point i am done with new get and i can go ahead uh, we have everything we have the configuration expression all right so we continue and let's bring back the slides to kind of just recap these are the packages we talked about. I think we've I've repeated them. Any questions so far? So uh, how does this compare with you know log for net or something like that? You know, why just another log? provider? OK, the one thing is, is let me bring that up uh, back page up. Uh, initially, I was actually looking into log for net because log for net does does support pretty much so I know you've used that in the past. Yes. Uh, but uh, versus serial log benchmarks. I think it was some benchmarks that I saw. OK. Uh, well, you can just describe it. You know. That's right here. So you know that that's from so serial log is often often referred to as a new logging dot net and log is the old one. Uh, let's see if that shows. All right, there was a site. See, I, I usually don't like to just say, you know, I would have, uh, I would have appreciated finding that, but it, it's a good, good question. But I saw benchmark numbers that that cited for Serilog. So for, for, yeah, go ahead. ahead. So I googled it up. It says that serial log has a uh, structured logging and more enrichment. I'm still yet to search. You know what is the structured logging and enrichment over the log for net and serial log is a pretty much new framework compared to the log for net. So it's more cool. modern. Yeah. I mean, definitely. And you get all the things, you know, that, that are available. So it's definitely very customizable. Uh, marks over. Uh, I am trying to find the numbers. Yeah, it's uh, performance measurement. All right, I'll 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 pass on that. But just uh, 
uh, it's more modern, uh, it's structured logging, but I know that Lock4Net also can support structured logging. So, uh, so you know, but anyways, uh, I, I also read some, you know, part of that decision was I, I found an article that did some benchmarks and, and serial log, they did come ahead, but I cannot dig that up right now. Okay, cool. Uh, Thanks, Jerry. Yeah, thank you. All right, so uh, we'll go back here and uh, and we'll continue. Uh, but before I do this, just because I'll just let me just do one one more Google search. Dot net Sarah log uh, benchmark numbers. Mm. All right, that's N log versus serial log. So you can see that in terms of throughput, of course, serial log is, is you know, much more capable. Uh, I was hoping for, but that's N log, no, but I have, you know, I found another one at, at, at some point that, that cited for serial log as well. Yeah, uh, although I can't resist Googling more to find that article, but I'll, I'll have to, you know, suppress that urge and, you know, for the sake of time. So uh, uh, we go here. So we went over the create default builder. Uh, at this point, so as everything in, in .NET Core is extensible, right? Uh, you know, and, and it, 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 we get uh, out of the box support for dependency injection. Uh, everything is, is, you know, composable, is built in piece by piece. Uh, one example is that service collection, right? So notice that here I'm registering a service and it's decoupled, it's clean code, it's, you know, solid because now, uh, you know, the, the program is just, you know, it already knows just knowing that this service exists is going to go and it's, it's going to instantiate it for me, given that that particular worker inherits from, it's a special uh, class, it inherits from background service, right, which is the long running class, it will go ahead running that exe at this point since i haven't configured it to run as a cron job or a windows server is going to run it as an exe is going to go is going to in invoke execute async is going to keep running that loop right that's how i've been, been debugging but notice see and that's something very interesting is is without having steps through the code maybe i could have read it somewhere but without having steps through the code i never registered any loggers here right but my worker service is already, and by the way, that that's totally fine. I, I uh, I'm getting these messages. Let's put it that way. I can still be writing these messages, but if I don't have any providers, it's not gonna, you know, the messages are not gonna go anywhere. But right now, out of the box, it, it's gonna log to console by default. Right. So where is that coming from? So now that, that we step through the, you know, the, the framework code or the platform code, I already know that, that by default, we already registered uh, some default packages, right? For logging that we may not want. So, so my first step now that, okay, so that that's my service. Let's imagine I have more you know, more services here. I mean, the concept holds as long as I'm able to get one message across. The next step will be, you know, uh, which we're not going to do today, unfortunately, which is run a benchmark, do a stress test. And if if that validates, then that could be a solid basic, but solid proof of concept. I can take that, you know, 
to to my manager or to the business say hey uh, that proof of concept held up let's go and 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 you know kind of implement i uh, probably a little bit more enhanced than this but um, i'm just saying the once you get the concept the workflow uh, and the numbers uh, to to back up the idea that will be sufficient to, you know to just take that and, and go ahead and, and and start to incorporate it in in an app so uh so right now this is using the default loggers but i don't want that right so i'm gonna go uh i'll stop here and ask any questions so we we continue uh dave any questions all good uh, i don't see any in the uh, message box in perfect. the uh, chat perfect so uh uh we'll go here uh, by the way the the question that that dave asked he you know uh, uh dave knows that that i i am a big uh, i was a big supporter of lock for net for a long time so but it's a valid question that can come from the business, can come from a sponsor, can come from, from you know, an uh, architect on the team or any team member, right? So it's a very valid question. Is we always use Log4Net, for example. Why is it that that we want to? And, and that would have been the opportunity for me to say, hey, listen, here is a benchmark and I can show you that. Or here is a trusted article from a trusted source showing certain numbers. Uh, I had that, but I just don't don't have it right now. But but that's actually a very valid question. Whenever you're bringing in new ideas, uh, new thoughts, uh, you gotta be able to back back those up. So that's just uh, a thought I wanted to share. So at this point, we know that uh, I don't need uh, the default logging, right? So let's go ahead. First off, I'm gonna start to add logging. And then I'll look and what is that logging taking? Well, log can take two things. Uh, I can take just add logging and then it's just going to add the, the default or I can have a log builder. And that's what I'm going to actually use. All right. And at this point, we can uh, add what we want. So first thing I'm going to do is I have access now to that log builder. So I'm going to clear everything that got registered by default from the create default builder call. Then next. Let's add the standard console. And now we want to add server log, right? And let's take a look here. So what switches do we have already in place by default? out of app settings. So out of app settings by default, right? And again, that build container already registered the app settings uh, with the program, so it knows to read configuration from there. So by default, guess what? We already have some switches, right? Uh, so the Microsoft libraries do log as well, and we're saying only show them for, you know, inform, you know for, for anything that's Microsoft, show warnings. And uh, only show, you know, if, that that package so information and the default is information, right? That's why what we're logging is information. Uh, I'm going to switch server log to debug, right? Because that that's what we want. We want verbose logs going there. And then you'll find that also, guess what? Because I'm taking all debug messages, Microsoft packages did have debug messages going to get written there as well. But the default switch here from for the console or any other default uh, uh, logger is information just something to note uh, initially that was very tricky and and I'll, I'll i'll go through it's not very but uh you know there was you know some some minutes of thoughts there to to try to kind of uh you know piece all of this together at this point i want to add server log right so that is the package that we just added right and what that registers is an i logger right so I'm going to, uh, we can do it here or just to be more concise, I can create a, another static function here and public static methods, public static 
logger that create a log logger and now uh, what I so I need to create a server log logger here to pass in to register uh, as a provider as a logger as part of my providers here so now this will get confused because I need server logs implementation so there is a you know it will tell you well if I remove this it will actually complain saying well I got two iLoggers that I'm getting confused uh, is it the Microsoft extension logger or server log well in that case it implements the same interface but I want the server log one and in here uh, uh, it's really var let me see if we can just copy paste some code. Yeah, we'll try to fix it. So, uh, all what it is, is is I need to create a logger, right? So var logger equal to uh, in server log, you start logger configuration, so you're telling it where where you want it. You know, you you have to configure the logger first. Um, at this point, I don't have anything in in my config file for server log, so let's start by defining an encode. So first thing I need is uh, uh, I'm gonna need to well. Uh, it's really a right to, uh, well, I want a filter, right? So I want server log to only log debug more verbose messages onto Mongo for me to kind of capture that and, and mine it, mine that data and critical information because I need inner exception information to also run queries against, you know, in a, as a you know, structure event data format. So the way to do this is, is first, because I want to create a filter here. So I'm going to go ahead and create almost a gate, you know, as if it's a quality gate or a uh, filter gate, right? And I'm going to go here and I go ahead, create a, a right to logger. So I'm, I'm creating an intermediate virtual logger, so to speak, in server log that's going to take in the information and fill the messages and, and filter it. And I would do that this way. I can go and I go first I want to create my filter right so and I only want to include levels right I want to include levels that uh, log event level dot debug right and then uh, I want to uh, what else do I need? So I need debug messages, and I also need and I need uh, well, what else do I need? I need fatal, right? So critical exceptions, right? Application level exceptions, but not 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 you know system or runtime exceptions. There will be custom application exceptions I'll be throwing to capture certain error conditions. So at this point, I created this 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 filter, right? This message filter. So imagine the messages are coming in as if it's like a pipeline. I got that that thing or logging destination or provider waiting. I take the message, say, okay, let me listen in on that message. Does that message have have that information I'm interested in? Is that level debug or fatal? If it is, then what we're gonna do, right? is now that we have this, we're going to write it and I'm going to start by writing it to a file, right? And at this point, uh, this is temporary, so I'm going to call that log data dot txt. It's going to go away. Again, my ultimate destination is MongoDB, right? But I'm building this progressively, right? Uh, ultimately, uh, I would have probably, you know, written unit, you know, unit tests or, or kind of uh, more of a test suite against this to test every piece. But for now, uh, I'm experimenting with this. First, I want to make sure server log is working fine. I want to focus on on the kind of the filtering of the message level 
then I want to take that to the next level and build in MongoDB. So, uh, and then there are a few things to note. One thing is Serilog does not, uh, it has a cache, it has a buffer, right? So it tries to be smart. It, it, it focuses on, you know, it, it, it's a more performant uh, logging package. And one thing that, that Serilog does is it, it writes messages in batches, right? So it, it buffers them and we can control that. Now, this is a small demo, so we don't want to, so we're going to control that. So in here, uh, it's a flush interval. In Mongo is number of records, right? So uh, it's a time span and I, I don't want, I want zero days, hours, zero minutes, and maybe uh, 10 seconds. So that's pretty much almost guarantee that uh, we're going to get a message for our demo, right? So at this point, uh, let's see where I am. I'm here, so I've written this to the file. Uh, I'm going to close my logger. So that's my, I basically create a wrapper, created a wrapper logger to do my filtering, right? Around that Mongo, uh, not the Mongo. At this point, I'm using the file sync of Serilog, right? And now that I'm done, I'm going to go ahead and configured my logger. Uh, all in code, nothing in config at this point, but that's step one. And at this point, I can, uh, if, uh, hmm, where is that going? What is this? Okay. And then I can do a say return logger. Well, guess what? I just returned my logger here. So I can go here. Two things. Uh, it's one. And then there is the other option, dispose true. And what that does is by default, it will call. So at, uh, uh, I'm not showing it here, but by the way, uh, Serilog also has a fallback or a default logger that we can define and configure. So if, uh, you know, um, um, Serilog receives a message, but it, it doesn't have, uh, you know, a configured logger that's, like an iLogger, an I, a provider that we, an iLogger instance that we're creating, it will fall back to the default logger. But I don't need that here because I got one configured. But part of that, uh, of the logger is disposing of the logger uh, uh, when when the, the program execution ends. So what dispose is going to do is going to make sure that it flushes uh, all the buffers and, and deallocates, closes uh, all the the, log, the logger syncs. Uh, questions so far. At this point, I create a filter to receive debug and fatal messages. They're going to go to Serilog. Meanwhile, I still have my console by default based on my config here. It's logging uh, information uh, level uh, debug messages to the console. And I'm going to start running that, but for it to do something semi interesting, uh, we'll probably need to, so I'm going to log an error, uh, debug. Debug, and we can say, uh, well, let's do it that way. Function. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to say here, uh, method, all right, and I'm going to go ahead and basic log and say that's debug. I don't think that that would be information. It will just overwhelm my, again, I'm, if I'm using a third party uh, logging, uh, logging provider, I may not, you know, but for, for our purposes, that would be too verbose for our volume. So that would be debug, not information. You know, it's kind of a uh, lower level in, in the stack for us. So, so say I wrote this. So my expectation is that this is going to go to the file and this is going to still go to console, right? So because I'm only factoring in, so exactly what exactly equals to uh, the level is a debug or an exception. So let's go ahead and run this and see if it works.
So I didn't put this in, in, in the thread loop here. So my expectation is that it's gonna write the info here. Now, uh, if we take a look at, I'll, I'll look at that next, but for now, let's just go ahead here. Uh, let's go to open folder. And it wrote nothing. Aha, uh -huh. I know why, but do we know why? Well, anybody can take a guess. File permission, write permission. I would have thought so too. And you know what? When I was debugging this, I actually ran through into this issue uh, when I was playing with this and I really spun my head looking, adding, you know, I, I ended up adding everyone to, to that folder, you know, so far as users and give them full access to eliminate that. But that's a very good point, but no, that wasn't it. It's something else I missed, uh, right here. Okay, I'll go ahead and any, any, any other guesses? All right, so guess are you what? Sure you got, are you sure you got a fatal error? No, I didn't get an error. Just nothing get, got written to my file. I, I know the answer to that, or hopefully will. But uh, but but I, I wanted to kind of uh, see if anybody can guess. So here's what it is. What's the default log level on serial log? I'm, I'm saying, OK, uh, I'm creating a funnel here, right? A filter, right? That will filter out messages so that I'm only including debug and fatal messages, right? Well, here's the trick. Did I, and it, it, you know, and did I actually receive that information message? So what I did when I when I faced this issue is I went and 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 switched that information to debug to information, and it came in fine. So that told me one thing. You see, and then I looked dug a little deeper in the documentation, right? So the default logging level that serial log starts at is information. Debug is less, right? So I'm waiting here trying to filter out messages, but I'm not getting debug messages to start with because at its root, serial log is only processing information and above. So there is actually another API call. My minimum level is debug. So now, guess what? I'm letting in debug and above messages. You know, so it'll be debug information, uh, error, fatal, right? Uh, the only thing that I'm filtering out at this point is verbose, right? Because it goes in order. It's an enumeration. Let me see if I'm able to. Uh, here. That's a serilog one. The dot net one is 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 except for fatal. They have critical. And it's also a five, so actually it's an interchangeable because the value is the same. So here are the debug levels, right? Verbose, debug, information. So if I allow information, which is the default, so it's information and above, right? So it's going to take information, warning, error, fatal. I need it to capture debug. Uh, and by default, it was starting at that. So guess what? I'm trying to filter this, but debug is not even coming, uh, coming in for me to filter it. You know, so with this, now we try again. And see that that's why I, I, I wanted to share that, that whenever we're starting something new and, and long term support now is three years uh, with dot net framework and web forms. With web forms, it was what? Many, many years, right? So that's not the way things work now. Now everything evolves so fast. So, so it, it's really uh, in a sense, being more comfortable digging deeper into things and, and in a sense, uh, creating more of a, of a routine of, of uh, learning and exploring is more important than, you know, like we're talking about .NET Core 3 now, right? Uh, if we're going to talk again in six months, it'll be .NET 5. And, and it, it's, it's more uh, the mindset and, and the strategy uh, of 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 kind of making use of 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 these little uh, nice uh, packages and features that that count in, in in my opinion. So let's now hope, right? If all went well, that this 
wrote. So let's see. Uh huh. And it did not. So why? So minimum level is debug. Uh, I got this project uh, working. So worst case scenario, I'll just open the working version. But now I'm very interested. Let's go back to worker. Log debug. Let's run this one more time. Mm. All right, let's take a look at the file one more time. If it wrote is fine. If not, then it will be a. Hmm. OK, so let's open the. The project. Let's just check one more thing. That's a problem with ad hoc demos. They may or may not work. Oh, I know why. Makes more sense. Did you guys see why I had my bug? Is my screen uh, clear enough? I had a, an end, so it can't be. All right, so now let's try it again. And, and that's why unit testing is very important, by the way. All right, let's try this again. Still does. Oh, here it is. OK. Yay. So, uh, but note something, because now I'm, I'm opting in uh, for debug messages, right? Uh, guess what also got written to my file? So I only wrote this. So the messages that, that the .NET Core runtime or .NET Core platform framework is writing the libraries is also captured, right? So I'm capturing debug. I can filter more, like I can have expressions, right? I can go, you know, filter crazy here and filter on certain text. But of course, that will, uh, in a sense, degrade performance, right? So I'm right here. I'm, I'm filtering on an enumeration. Uh, uh, effectively, I'm, I'm, I'm filtering on an int, right? On a value, uh, direct value type. I'm not filtering on substrings or, you know, you know, stuff that that may may you know slow me down so uh questions so far so i've gotten a filter in i'm writing my information at this point to console or to anywhere else of course in, in a enterprise app is not going to go to console and then uh, i got my you know i'm filtering on certain levels that these are going to right now the file just for our demo next step they're going to go to mongodb any questions so far going once OK. All right, let's talk about MongoDB real quick. So so MongoDB, we talked about the community edition being available for free. So I could have uh, this is a you know a VM. Uh, I could have just set it up there. Uh, you know, a quicker way to do it, especially for local test, you know, development is uh, I've leveraged Docker. So it, Windows 10. Uh, uh, supports what's called Docker for desktop and you can just install it. And what this does if I'm running, uh, I can run, so, so you know, think of Docker as, uh, you know, as, as a, you know, almost VMware, right? As, as a virtual machine, but instead uh, it's a virtual process, right? So you're running, uh, a snapshot of your application uh, on on a virtual infrastructure that, that could be either a virtualized infrastructure, you know, Linux or Windows, right? Uh, it, it, it could be, uh, it wouldn't make sense, although I, I did it, which is running uh, a Windows container in Windows. You might as well just, just make use of the, you know, a, you, you still do incur a cost. Uh, in terms of uh, performance, right? So you don't want to do that. So uh, right here, I'm running a Linux uh, Docker container for MongoDB, uh, and it's running already, and I'm able to connect to it. 
Uh, hey, Sam, are you going to be able to share your slides in the uh, code? Sure, sure, definitely. Uh, that's a document, by the way, so we're talking about do what documents are. I'm, I'm going to clear that and we're going to generate these again in our demo, but uh, note that, that that's pretty much what a document is, right? So that's a document. That's all the fields uh, that I captured, and they're represented here in you know, as, you know in JSON format as just kind of key value types. Uh, questions so far? Nothing in the chat. Perfect. So at this point, I'm uh, I just looked at the clock and I realized that I have about six minutes to go. So, uh, but it's good because all what we need to do now is switch to Mongo, right? So Mongo, all what MongoDB is, is another sync, right? Uh, so I was writing to a file, but note that uh, I I need my my structured, you know, data now, right? So I want to be able to query. So I wrote a string here, right? But I don't want to write this as a string. I actually, just like that slide showed, I want a field just by writing this. Uh, and you know, I'll, I would have to write it uh, a little differently, but I want to capture not just that message as a string, but I want a mine of how many uh, distinct methods am I calling between, you know, a certain time or, you know, how, you know, I need to know what what what's my code, you know, what what's the the hot path uh, for my code, you know, at a certain time, you know, when when the application is not not performing, or I, I or users are calling and and they're they're reporting, you know, sporadic issues. So to be able to mine that information that without doing you know substrings and uh, one way is out of the box is leveraging structured data, right? And uh, the way uh, I would just go uh, about doing that is, is note that I set function method uh, in my file, right? Uh, it's just logged it as a string, right? So, but now I want to, I want to be able to, uh, to capture that information in Mongo, right? And, and, and uh, by the way, I can, I could have used you know templates and other tricks, but but Mon the Mongo uh, the Mongo sync already supports that. So let's see what what structured information, structured data, event data will mean having written that that would have, would have been a string elsewhere. And to do that, let me uh, just paste paste something here. Uh, So let's see if that work. Uh, so let's replace. Okay, I'll replace all of this right here. So all what I did here, uh, just not to confuse everyone, uh, same. And instead of creating, and I kept this just to compare it side by side, instead of writing it to a file, now I'm writing, again, it's another sync, it's another destination. It doesn't make a difference. Now I know that I got this working, right? Actually, uh, let me do this, because that's only debug. Now, I already know that I got this working. Right, so it won't make a difference at this point. What I'm debugging next is my connectivity to MongoDB, right? Because I already know that, that this works. And notice here, the next step real quick, the last minute, I'll show you how to, to put this in config, right? It's the same, pretty much uh, the same format represented in, in the app settings file. But all what it is, is as I, just like the SQL connection string, got my MongoDB connection string. That's my database, it's called demo. And then the collection, you know, we talked about collections within the database called logs. And again, it caches, I believe the default is 50, see? Uh, I'm setting it to one just before the demo, so it, it ends up flushing the buffer uh, for us to see it. All right, let's go ahead and run this. Uh, 
log and I'm adding my logger. Okay, this should just work. And at this point, uh, I cleared, you know, my collection records. So what am I expecting to get there? So let's see. Cool, so I'm running at this point. So my expectation is for the one message, if all works, uh, I'm expecting to write this message, right? But it's gonna be a little different from it being just a string, right? It's gonna be structured event data, which, you know, let's see by example now if this works, here we go. Again, that's the, the Microsoft library debug messages. Yeah, but for me, so notice this is my message template. That's my message, right? At this point, had this been a string? But notice that I got something additional. It actually extracted methods, right? And now, guess what? I have this as a key value. So if I go here and say view my document, at this point, I have the ability, instead of doing string dot contains, right? If I wanted to answer the question of how many invocations, I mean, this is execute async. I mean, we, we know how this works, but imagine that was a service uh, class, right? I want to know how many uh, invocations am I, and you know, I mean, there is a, you know, uh, God, the, the dot net, uh, you know, there are packages we can add in to, to listen into that, but but say I, I, I you know, I want to capture, you know, different metrics, right? I mean, you know, how many invocations of the function that, that may be a bad example here, but 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 that helps us answer it that that we're able to capture uh, you know, we're not logging strings anymore. These are key value pairs that we can uh, query on. Uh, same goes at this point, so that's that's an example here. Now this really stands out in exceptions, right? So one thing uh, that 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 this really helps with uh, is writing exceptions. So exceptions, you you know, in some instances, especially if we're wrapping, you have an application exception wrapping an underlying exception. The the wrapped exception goes as an inner exception, right? So I want to capture all all these fields. So we talked about enrichments, right? And one enrichment is uh, uh, enrich dot with we downloaded, we pulled from NuGet, right? is the exception details enrichment. So let's go ahead and, and throw an exception and see what, what you know, structured logging would be helpful for. At this point, while I'm copying pasting, any questions, did I uh, confuse anybody yet? Well, that uh, won't be any. Don't see any. Perfect. So I'm gonna go ahead here and create a custom application exception. Add class. And I call it my custom exception. All right, I'm gonna. It's perfect. So let's imagine I'm 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 wrapping uh, another inner exception and I'm adding a user ID, right? And let's go ahead and throw that exception somewhere. And of course, given that I only have one test class here, so let's throw it in here to see how it's going to get logged now as serial log. So at this point, I'm throwing an exception. I'm logging it as critical. Critical uh, translates into fatal so far as the log level. So let's go ahead and run that and see what I'm going to get in Mongo. Perfect. Notice that that I'm logging information and above to the console. So the console also captured it, but at this point, uh, the inner exception is is more of a uh, it's more of a string, right? The inner exception in here is a string. But again, I don't want to parse text and look for substrings. I want so the beauty comes the power of structured logging here. 
See now I throw this exception here and with that enrichment for exceptions, note that how it stored uh, my exception. So my inner exception here, I can mine on that. See, I captured the message, I captured the source. So this is no longer just a string that I can only do a substring on. And I can go ahead here in a view document and see how my document object is represented. See, I have my inner exception and I got key value pairs that I can mine on, not just, you know, a blob, not just a string. So that's the power of structured data in this example, right? It gave me more data that I can easily mine on. Uh, the beauty of MongoDB also I can add indexes for faster searches on on anything, right? Once the record exists, once I have at least uh, one record with a certain field, I can uh, add an index on it. So it's very flexible and it comes in very handy. So I can add an index on uh, properties dot. It, it's, you know, it, 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 it's almost, you know, it's, think of it as JavaScript, you know, as JSON, right? So it's properties dot exception detail dot inner exception dot source and I can now uh, you know run queries on where source equal equals you know certain value for example and it scales I mean we have I can write you know millions of records here and uh, you know it, one even it runs in, in, in pretty fast and it's a community edition again what we ended up using. So at least in this example. Uh, OK, so uh, the one thing that, that I said I will do uh, real quick. Uh, is so this is in, in code, right? That's an API I'm calling. So of course we don't want a hard code, right? So I'm going to go ahead and remove this. I want to read it from configuration, right? So one NuGet package I, you know, uh, imported is serilog dot configuration, right? Let's see what exactly what it's called. Is serilog dot mm, here settings dot configuration, and now what this allows me to do is to load uh, that information from configuration. For me to do this, uh, basically. Uh, I don't need any of that, right? Because this is all hard coded stuff. I need to be able to change them in config. Uh, I do, however, need to load the config so I can say read from and that API is now available for me now that I did import that package. And now uh, I'm leveraging. We already found out that the default builder, the container builder here, the create default builder does register and bind to app settings. I know they exist already. So all what I need to do is I go to host context. And I can do configuration, right? So I pass the configuration uh, file uh, to server log and saying, OK, go ahead and find, uh, you know, the appropriate uh, switches here, right? So now I want to create and config everything I created here, right? And let me just see if I'm able to copy paste something so we don't have to. Uh, yeah, let's try this. So I'm going to go to my app settings. I could, you know, probably go in development, but here is fine. And uh, let's just make sure everything is well formed. Uh, yes, it is. So I'm going to go ahead here. And I'm going to go ahead and go to program. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and all right. Perfect. So let's see what is it that we did. So we were minimum level is debug, right? So I went server log, minimum level is debug, right? Write to another wrapper logger, so I'm able to filter. Write to another wrapper logger, so I'm able to filter. All right, but now I mean there are additional things. This is where we needed the ser log filters expressions because of what we're going to do next. All right, I'm filtering by including only level debug and level critical. 
can't speak by now. Uh, filter, including only level debug, level fatal. So fatal is the same as critical. Uh, it's the same level, right? It's just the num value five. It's just the .NET framework package calls it critical. It translates here to fail, fatal, and we just you know show that it worked. Enrich with exception details. Okay, enrich with exception details. See, there is a one-to-one -one map here, and then write to MongoDB. Write to MongoDB batch one collection database URL this is the equivalent of these parameters. So I basically converted my hard-coded value to configuration. So we run this one more time, and well, right now I got seven records, so hopefully I'll have a couple more after this. Now there's a lot of interesting things to show here that we could have also showed, right? So uh, we can run a stress test and show benchmarks. That would be something very interesting, right? But you got to start, you know, with, with the basics. Yeah, so here we go. So that was pretty much the equivalent all the flags that we wrote in code, you know, they are the same flags uh, we just represented in config, right? Uh, you know, uh, but that's that's pretty much at core what that does. There's a lot more interesting things to also show and demonstrate with MongoDB, creating indexes, querying on things, kind of showing this more in action, you know, exceptions and how, how we're able to mine on, on inner exceptions, for example, using structured data. But that's what structured event data enabled us to do. We converted what would have been as plain dull strings into interesting key value pairs that we're able to mine on. Uh, um, um, that, that's pretty much it. Any questions uh, for me? That's pretty cool because it's always a question of how to properly uh, log exceptions. Basically, you're logging everything. <clears throat> yeah, and 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 like, like I said, I uh, uh, it, it has millions of records, and it's not, you know, no hiccups, not even right, right. And 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 if we're gonna go with the online, so there is a free tier uh, uh, with the Mongo Atlas. You can set up a 500 megabyte cluster uh, uh, with Atlas on AWS and it, it's totally free. So, uh, you know, to play with it, experiment with it, uh, it, it, it's pretty cool, it's pretty powerful. I mean, MongoDB is made to scale. Sure. Uh, you can, you know, set up sharding pretty easily, you know, kind of horizontal scaling. It's always uh, the question of, of what, when we say scaling is, is I want as, as minimal downtime or no downtime as possible, right? So all Whatever infrastructure that allows me to scale horizontally, which Mongo does just by adding more shards, uh, is beautiful. Same as you know Kubernetes. Same you know any orchestration tool is. Is whenever I'm able to scale horizontally, I may have no downtime to very little downtime. If I'm scaling vertically, if I'm adding more resources, most likely I'm going to need to you know reboot at some point. Also, I think uh, Cosmos. DB and uh, Azure also has a free tier now. That that is cool. I need I need to go and look back at that. Cool. Well, thanks a lot, Sam. I appreciate it. And uh, they said a couple of people that were asking about the um, uh, putting your code in in uh, examples somewhere in your slides. Sure. I'll uh... I'll put these up and I'll 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 provide a, a, a link that maybe we can uh, we can yeah. just uh, send over to everybody. People are doing this on GitHub now, right? Like you have yeah. your own GitHub public repository and it's kind of a log of uh, what you've presented and all that as well. Sure, definitely. Right. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, yeah. Sam. Thanks, Dave. Thanks a lot. Appreciate. It. I'm gonna. I did record finally. I was logged. I wasn't logged in as my. I was logged in in, in another Microsoft account, <clears throat> so I couldn't turn on recording right away. Mine says two hours and twenty-seven minutes. Like it almost looks like it like concatenated the two meetings. 
but I'll sort it out. And we'll take a look at the video, see how it looks. Cool. All right. Thanks a lot. Thank see you. Thank you, Dave, for having me. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Good to see you, Ray. See ya. See ya. Have a good night, everyone. Stop recording.